Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andres Carrasquillo. I am a senior regional planner at uh, SCAG. And welcome to this afternoon's Toolbox Tuesday session, Planning with Rural Communities, Stories from Southern California. And as we begin, I'd like to go over a, a few logistics for our session. This uh, meeting uh, will go uh, an hour and a half. This meeting is recorded and all participant lines will be muted. Uh, at the end, there will be a large Q&A session and we will also have sh very short Q&A sessions after each uh, of the three presentations. Um, and if you have any questions during a presentation, we invite you to type it into the chat box or you could press your, the, the raise hand function and uh, we'll call on you to, to um, ask your question or if there's anything that needs to be restated from what was asked in the chat, we'd invite you to, you know, to come off mute as well. Uh, we will uh, log all questions and then voice a selection at the end of the presentation. And a recording of this webinar and the slides will be available on the SCAG website. Uh, we'll send a link to everybody uh, who has registered for the event. Uh, today, we will have uh, three presentations uh, followed by a Q&A. The first on the Imperial County Colonial Infrastructure Assessment presented by uh, David Wells Roland Holst, PhD, who is a research professor at the Department of Agricultural uh, and Resources Economics at, at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, we uh, ha That presentation will be followed by uh, Rockwood Rollout Quick Build in Calexico, presented by Carlos Velasquez, a senior planner and regional managing director at KOA Corporation. And uh, our final presentation will be on sidewalks for Muskoi Coalition, presented by Maha Rizvi, the district director for the Office of Assembly Member Eloise Gomez Reyes. And just to offer a few uh, framing remarks on the theme of today's session, planning with rural communities, uh, we need to to explore what it means to build a process of uh, what of planning with communities. Um, within this process, initiatives embrace a model of community leadership to identify key problems and create solutions. Uh, within this process, agencies serve as ongoing partners that contribute funding, data, and other resources, and also facilitate connections. And all partners integrate technical and community expertise. So here, I will uh, pass the mic over to uh, David to present on the Imperial County Colonial Infrastructure Assessment Plan. And uh, David, if I got your position uh, wrong in the department, please forgive me. No, but it's fine. Yeah, that, that's yours. You got it absolutely right. Yeah, it's fine. I'm a research professor. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to share my whole desktop. So uh, you might see, as I said, photos of my kids and things, but uh, it's a little bit more convenient this way. Let me uh, open first the PowerPoint and then we can get started. Does everybody have a full size PowerPoint in their screen now? Yeah, looks great. Okay, great. Let's go forward then. Uh, thank you very much, Andres, and uh, everybody uh, who's organized this uh, this seminar. I think it's fantastic that you have a, a essentially a capacity sharing uh, uh, initiative like this. And I really hope that uh, the work that we're doing can uh, can support activities by other people. Um, we're always available. Uh, my email address is at the end of this, these slides. And other work we've done, you can see on the website down in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, I'll give you some very quick background on our organization and our team, and then talk about the project. Uh, and then I'll give you some kind of uh, in direct engagement with the tools that we've, we're developing to, to do our work. Uh, Bear was founded in 2002 by me and some colleagues at Cal. Uh, and uh, since that time, we've worked for a whole alphabet soup of Cal California state agencies, as you can see here. Most recently, SCAG, we're uh, working with uh, 
Gwendy Silver, who is our project manager on this study, and we're doing some other work uh, with uh, with uh, other uh, other parts of Skag, uh, at having a fantastic time. We really enjoy uh, we really enjoy the relationship. I have to say, we've done a lot of work in Sacramento, and uh, things are quite a bit less stuffy uh, <laughs> in the Southland in terms of our, inst our institutional partnerships and relationships. So. This has been uh, uh, a lot of fun for us. This is the team that's working on this particular project. That's me uh, up in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Sam and Drew are former uh, graduate students of mine and uh, now uh, postdocs. Uh, actually, uh, Drew is a postdoc. Uh, Sam is a, a senior scientist at Stanford nowadays. And Graciela Chong is a, a master's uh, public policy student at uh, Cal who's helping manage the project and giving us some really exemplary communication skills that we need in this region. Uh, Graciela is uh, of uh, Chinese ancestry and Honduran uh, uh, ancestry. So she, uh, she she speaks a lot of really interesting uh, Central, um, Central American dialects and has worked intensively and extensively in the Central Valley uh, for farm, uh, farm worker uh, community support. And when we have, uh, we always have a, a, a few uh, research interns and other people helping us out. Uh, the general project is um, basically to look at uh, in, the Imperial County Colonias uh, communities. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with those, but Colonias are a very distinctive uh, community uh, type, of which there are only 13 in California and a few in other Western states. Uh, most in proximity to the border, but uh, and concentrated uh, with, with relatively highly concentrated uh, Latin populations. Uh, but they have a more informal administrative status than uh, municipalities. And they also have a lot of uh, relatively significant challenges as economically disadvantaged communities. The Biden administration is preparing to make a very substantial commitment to improve infrastructure resources in that uh, in those communities and related disadvantaged communities in California. And in advance of that, uh, SCAG was asked and they asked us to conduct an infrastructure assessment uh, to identify needs and challenges uh, to help support the, this, these investment activities, to essentially help provide a roadmap for infrastructure rehabilitation in the county. Uh, Imperial County, as you know, is uh, one of the more disadvantaged counties in the state, um, and uh, it has some relatively chronic uh, structural challenges in terms of, uh, of infrastructure services. So uh, the time span for the project is uh, basically a, a year, we've got about a year and a half to go on this. And in order to do the assessments, we I'm going to go quickly through technical slides, but uh, the basic resources we're developing right now are a data inventory in order to help us uh, do the assessment. Um, and that uh, actually has been a really uh, rewarding e exercise. We were a little bit scared going into this because we knew that data was relatively scarce on the ground. But it turns out that uh, in the last five years, very quietly, uh, data resources and especially digital uh, resources have been improving very dramatically. And uh, they're going to give us a lot of tailwind on this. We thought we'd be doing lots of direct household surveys to try to find out what's going on. But uh, it turns out that uh, the utilities particularly uh, and other state agencies have been building up their data resources. And so we have much better data than we ever imagined we were going to get. And I'll share that with you today. Ultimately, I, I, as far as I know, almost all of this is in the public uh, domain. So you should be able to get access to it. And we'd be happy to, to share what we can with you. There will be confidentiality issues when we get down to the address level in our own data, but we have a lot of other stuff that uh, you can basically uh, start working with uh, if you're interested. Uh, we're using some very useful private uh, digital tools too. Uh, there's the uh, OpenStreetMap, which is a fascinating uh, uh, initiative, uh, basically of contributed data from uh, from the general public who are going around with their mobile phones and literally entering GIS related data and contributing it to a commons uh, of data. So this was essentially a, a, a big discovery for us and it's helped us a lot because these areas are, are as I said, they're quite remote and relatively neglected, but OpenStreetMap has, has provided a lot of uh, data for us. Uh, Microsoft has a 
relatively exhaustive inventory of uh, building footprints, which they've uh, developed from, uh, from remote sensing data, mainly satellite photographs. Uh, and then we've done a lot, so a lot of manual fill-in work uh, in order to uh, add extra information because there are a lot of sort of ambiguous uh, structures in this. Uh, and, and the condition of the infrastructure often requires direct observation. Uh, RVs versus houses versus mobile homes, et cetera, are a little bit hard uh, at times with satellites, as you'll see in a few minutes. Uh, we've got parcel maps now. We've got address level data on service connectivity. The water, the electricity uh, utilities have have, uh, have now very specific uh, uh, spatial data, which didn't exist, as I said, five years ago. And road data has be, been improved uh, much more than the roads have <laughs> in this area. Uh, Caltrans has developed some pretty substantial things. Here's, I'll give you an example just to get us started. This is a... a Using Google Maps, which we can embed all of this information in, uh, we're able to look at some of the colonial um, uh, communities. I'm going, to, I'm going to go directly to the, our interface a little bit later, but right now this is just a snapshot of Salton Sea Beach, one of these communities. And here, uh, uh, the residential living units have orange roofs and green roofs are, uh, temp are temporary mobile or uh, other uh, structures. So in Salton Sea, we see about 70% uh, trailers, mobile homes, about 25%, uh, sorry, 25% single family homes, and then about 5% RVs. Here's Brawley, another town in the Colonius uh, group, which uh, has a somewhat different composition, about 60% uh, single family homes and 20% uh, apartments. Uh, adjacent to commercial activities, commercial buildings are purple, as you can see from the key on the left-hand side. Here's Neeland, which is another uh, colonial. It's about half single family homes and half mobile homes. Winterhaven is a little bit different because there's a retirement community here. And as some of you may be aware, if you know about the Salton Sea region or, uh, or Imperial generally, it has become a haven for, uh, for retirees, which is creating a slight dualistic society there. And that's, that's a special kind of challenge. Uh, there are some benefits from having higher income residents uh, in terms of job creation, which uh, unfortunately is made concentrated at the lower levels of the service sector, but still uh, there are opportunities there for local residents. But that also creates a kind of de facto apartheid framework where the, the other services that follow these investments in real estate tend to uh, be uh, to reinforce inequalities. So uh, that's an interesting challenge. And hopefully uh, this, this new investment initiative can, uh, can, I wouldn't say create convergence because that would have to pull back the, uh, the, uh, the higher quality uh, residential areas, but um, at least convergence in the other direction. That is to bring up the, the lower income groups to uh, much more comparable levels of public goods. I mean, I, we're only talking about public goods here, so there really shouldn't be any rationing mechanism, uh, I think, uh, but there has been de facto because the service providers have basically been responding uh, primarily to the, uh, to the higher uh, uh, real estate uh, value areas. And you can see some more examples, Bombay Beach and Sealy and so on. Uh, we don't have to go into too uh, excruciating detail here, but uh, once we finish the assessments, that's a baseline, then we're going to look at scenarios going forward about how the investments might uh, actually make a difference. And we, for that, we use our own uh, economic model of, uh, of, the, of the California economy, which uh, basically goes down to the census tract level. It's a, there's a model we have a, we have a forecasting model for the whole economy. We disaggregate that with a with a framework called Implan, and that takes us to the county level. Then we can further disaggregate those results to the uh, to the census tract level, which gives us a very high level of resolution for targeting policy. And this is really what we're trying to achieve here. Here's an example from another project we did for the for the uh, California. Uh, uh, electric power grid managers, which was, uh, they wanted to know what would be the effects of more renewable energy uh, deployment in, in uh, disadvantaged communities. And so this particular result shows savings on public health costs from improved air quality uh, because of lower pollution levels. 
And the, the highlighted areas here are so-called disadvantaged communities. That's a special category. I think many of you know what, that, they, what they are. It's the lowest quintile of the income distribution and the highest quintile in terms of uh, environmental burden. And those communities are about uh, 2,500 of them in California, and they're highly concentrated in the Southland. LA has about half of them, actually. And the Central Valley has another very significant uh, proportion. But what we find is that improvements in air quality from renewable uh, electricity would actually confer substantial savings on these low-income households because they're, already, they're carrying the burden of uh, their environmental exposure at, at the household level in terms of medical care for chronic respiratory problems and lower life expectancy. So having this uh, census tract level really allows us to identify the inequities in, uh, in the incidence of, uh, of, uh, of public health costs. Okay, uh, that's just a very quick summary of what we're doing, but I'm gonna take a minute now to show you the, uh, the interface that we work with. Uh, this is a, a open source, anybody can have access to it. It's called QGIS, it's an open source software product that's made in the Netherlands. Uh, which allows you to do uh, really quite high quality GIS mapping work. Now, uh, uh, these are all the colonias uh, in California. There are 13 of them, as I said. There are two in the Salton Sea, one nearby, that's Neyland, that's Bombay Beach. I'm going to go in in a minute and show you more, but I wanted to show you the whole group. They're all concentrated just north of the border, uh, which is right there. And especially in the drainage uh, area of the Salton Sea. So if we go in a little bit closer, let's just pick out a candidate here. Uh, let me see. There's Neil, you saw that before. Let me go up to Bombay Beach. Let me see that one. I don't want to take too much time since we want to have time for questions. Okay, there's Bombay Beach, oops. And we can zoom in a little bit. Okay, there's Bombay Beach as it is uh, from a satellite view. The red line is a, a boundary that we've created uh, for the colonias. That shows you the administrative boundary of the colonias. As I said before, we also have parcel data. So uh, you can see parcel boundaries uh, should be in white here. I don't know if you can see that. This is this elevation. Uh, yeah, you can barely see them. See those white lines, very fine white lines. Parcels are quite important for uh, figuring out the um, ownership, uh, the asset underlying asset ownership, because uh, you can have two homes that are next to each other. They have one has they look similar from the air, but they actually one has twice as much uh, property. Then we have all the roads in the system, which are classified according to improved, unimproved, etc. Most of them are, actually most roads in the Colonias are paved with asphalt. That's the light blue color. Uh, I can show you the um, key, I think, yeah. There we go. Asphalt paved roads are the dominant road, but the quality varies tremendously. So to call them improved roads is, is in many cases a euphemism because they might've been paved uh, 40 years ago. Uh, and we've got to get closer to really make a, a, a better gradations there. Now, classifying buildings, as I said, we are we do that too. So you can see the roof from the roof colors, what the um, what the different categories are. So single family house is orange. Multifamily home is a light lighter orange. There are none of those here per se. Or uh, actually, yeah, no, there there are both here actually. Uh, apartments, there are no apartments uh, in, in, in Bombay Beach per se. RVs uh, are light blue and mobile homes are green, et cetera. So we've got very high resolution, uh, li literally address level. Now we go beyond that, uh, the address for our address level data, uh, each address has a, a set of data records that have to do with demographic characteristics and uh, quality characteristics for the structure that uh, that uh, is the structures or structures that are, are at a given address. So what we end up with ultimately is an SQL database for all of this information, which we can search by different standards. We can develop metrics for, um, for, for infrastructure needs 
service access, service availability. How far is a hospital? How far is a school? How far do you have to uh, go to get to public transit? All this information will be is being consolidated in one uh, database. And as I said, that piece of it, the, the last piece I described, which contains uh, um, more specific household information, that's going to be restricted in terms of uh, of access. It has to be, you know. But um, even within SCAG, there might be exceptions. But uh, we'd be happy to discuss with anybody uh, their interest in in getting uh, getting more information uh, about what we're doing, and uh, really happy to share. There's my email address. Uh, feel free to to uh, get in contact if you have more questions. Uh, Wendy, as I said, Wendy Silver is our project manager, and she's uh, uh, she wants to, to us to make any contributions we can across the, the organization. Uh, we hope that these new digital resources, which I really, we were very startled to find them, can really improve uh, assessment and targeting. As you know, you know, California's diversity is a miraculous thing, but it's also a great challenge for policymakers because the, the existing distribution of resources and outcomes is very heterogeneous. I think we're all well aware of that, but also the needs that are implied by that and the appropriate targeting of policies has to be equally uh, heterogeneous. So we're, we feel very fortunate to have this kind of micro uh, data, data resource to inform, uh, inform better policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. This was a really great overview and, and thank you for also kind of sharing just the the map and, and, and the geography of these colonias. Uh, I, I have one question before moving to the, the next panelist. Um, and that's re uh, regarding kind of like your some of the next steps for the data. Uh, are there mm -hmm. any or what are your team's next uh, plans for having community members either engage with or add to yep. the, this this data that you've collected so far? We're getting uh, to the end of our basic consolida data consolidation phases, and I said we were we were fortunate to do this more quickly than we expected because of the new digital resources that are available. But we do want to essentially ground truth some of this information, uh, particularly when it comes to the quality of the infrastructure assets. So we'll be uh, we'll be visiting the region uh, in order to uh, essentially validate uh, uh, some of the data, but. I think your your question is a little bit more trenchant in the sense that um, local engagement is going to be essential to our progress and our success in this uh, exercise. And we haven't gotten to that stage yet, but we believe that it's indispensable. And uh, the first step in that direction will be for us to, when we have the data available, we'll do presentations to local groups and we'll ask them to help us order priorities for uh, infrastructure improvement. Because we can quantitatively assess the gaps, you know, and uh, the conditions and needs, but uh, we don't really know whether people are more interested in streetlights than they are in potholes. And if choices have to be made, we feel like they should have a very influential voice in how those priorities are ordered. So uh, that will be the first uh, activity: is to basically enlist the the uh, local populations to help us set priorities. And I think when they see the information resources we have and they think about it in these ways, then they'll begin to view this as, a, as um, something that um, that's, can be directly beneficial to them. Uh, we don't want to approach without that because I think we'll just be seen as you know, more outsiders that are meddling around and trying to do property development or something like that. But we're very interested in getting their input on uh, setting priorities. And then we hope that that will help to uh, initiate a consultative process for the investment program itself, because we're going to recommend very strongly that uh, those who follow us and actually commit these financial resources maintain that engagement and use it as a uh, uh, as a navigation tool for their own uh, their decision making. Did that answer your question, Andres? 
may have lost the audio. I'm not sure. Yeah, yes, David, this is Tom uh, from Skype. Yeah, yeah. And yes, yeah. Andres, um just got disconnected. So he will be. Oh, he dropped out. Okay. Second. Yeah. Fair enough. So um, just, just to get this, um, you know, get the conversation going. So I think it's time for uh, the second presenters to, uh, to, to come on and, and continue this, this series. So uh, with that, I would like to pass it on Carlos um, to start your, your, your presentation. And, and Andres, welcome back. Great. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, sound check, can y'all hear me? I'm good. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Velasquez. I'm a, a senior planner managing director here at KOA Corporation. So we're the lead consultant with SCAG and the city of Calexico on implementing uh, this uh, quick build project in downtown Calexico. So um, have a brief agenda here. Um, so I'll start a little bit on sort of the, the team structure, uh, what the background is of the project, um, and then discuss a little bit more on that, get into the goals, um, and then into what the project uh, currently looks like and what the next steps are. So that's, that's what we'll go through um, over the next 10, 15 minutes. So uh, this project has a real, uh, a, large team on it. Uh, on the left side, you see the two agencies, the city of Calexico, which we're directly coordinating with on the project. So we have two staff from the city that we're working with on that. And then on the SCAG side, they're the ones that are handling a lot of the, the project um, administration, invoicing, um, and sort of controlling the monies that go to Calexico. So through that, we're coordinating with Corey and, and their local rep, uh, David Salgado, in, in um, in, in the Imperial County. Um, on the right, you see our project team led by KOA with, with uh, sub-consultants here LA, Leslie Scott, Safe Routes, for, uh, Safe Routes Partnership and LA County Bike Coalition. They're all doing different aspects on the project that all sort of uh, manifest as um, uh, in, in different types of engagement, which we'll, we'll touch on as we go. So a little bit on the project, um, the city of Calexico worked with SCAG back in 2018, applied for sustainable communities uh, program grant funds uh, to, to implement uh, this promenade street closure in downtown Calexico. Um, this project has been a priority for the city for several years, uh, probably almost two decades, at least that's our understanding. And really the importance of the project is that the city wanted to find ways to revitalize the downtown area while also providing almost an entryway from the port of entry uh, with, with the Mexicali uh, border crossing into Calexico. So it, it, it almost would serve as like a welcome for people who are crossing the border um, and also provide a space uh, for residents in Calexico to go and, and spend time. In. And, and I'll show some photos of where we're at um, a little later, but that's really the goal of the project. So in November, 2021, uh, almost a year and a half ago is when we kicked off the project officially with SCAG and Calexico. Um, and, and so far, um, you know, we, we have several of these uh, elements implemented, which again, I'll, I'll show a little later. So first off, what is a quick build project? Um, so this has been something that has been of quite popularity lately. Um, as, as folks here might know, uh, it takes quite a bit of time and it is quite expensive to implement permanent build constructions, essentially breaking concrete, uh, hiring a contractor to do the installation, do all the traffic control. Not to say that doesn't happen with these types of projects, but um, the fact that you're not, you know, breaking concrete, dealing with a ton of drainage issues, which, you know, we, you can accommodate pretty easily with these, um, and also using usually what we call like, um, like temporary semi-permanent materials, which usually are made of rubber, wood, um, and other types of materials like that, 
mean that the product is a little less expensive and can be implemented much more quickly. So what that allows is instead of a city having to spend a ton of time in procuring funds, millions of dollars, uh, depending on the project, um, setting up their CIP to accommodate that, um, this allows for relatively quicker implementation at a fraction of the cost. So that's what, what the city of Calexico applied for, for and this is what, what they're doing with this project. Now, the big thing with a project like this is that it does allow for tweaking and adjustments as a project is implemented. So that is a really big uh, benefit of these projects. And that is something that we're hearing as this project has now been implemented and on the ground. We're actively hearing from the city and, and stakeholders on other things they'd like to see, other tweaks they'd like us to make. And we can go ahead and do that relatively easily um, and, you know, and, and accommodate some of those needs. So th those are some of the, the main benefits of, of a quick build project, but that's really what it entails. It is also designed to be there, um, you know, say six months to a year. We've seen others that have lasted a, a little longer than that. The only issue once they last a little longer is obviously maintenance because the materials aren't designed to be there for that long. So um, it's making sure that you know there's appropriate maintenance and replacement of these materials as you know they they wear out or you know or they're damaged. So that is a, a little bit on what a quick build project is. So just to provide a little more context, um, I, I know folks here, I think most folks know where Calexico is, but for those who don't, so on the left side, you see um, the state of California. Uh, the state of Calexico is located in Imperial County, which is on the so, uh, southeast corner of the state there in red. Um, zooming in to the, to the middle, you'll see that Calexico is a border town. Um, it borders directly with Mexicali in Mexico, which is a much larger city. Um, and it, it, they have definitely a, an interesting relationship where we do, we, we have noticed that a lot of people who live in Mexicali travel to Calexico um, and work uh, in the large agricultural community in, in Imperial County and then sort of travel back. But, you know, a lot of people in Calexico also travel to Mexicali to do shopping, entertainment, uh, different things like that. So there's, there's a very close relationship between both cities. So traveling through them and through the port of entry um, is quite the norm uh, in, in this area. On the right side, you'll see more of a local context. Uh, so on the, on the south side of the, of the map, you'll see that's, that's Mexicali. Um, and then our project area is, is in that square box there. Um, so as you can see, it's right at the port of entry uh, with Mexicali. So that again is, is, is quite, uh, shows the importance of, of this project and, and the city's goal of making it almost like a welcome area for people who are crossing the border. So project goals, I touched on this a little bit, um, but you know, re-envision Rockwood as a prominent plaza space, um, you know, close it to cars, make it a, a space for the community to be. Um, promote walking and bicycling. Um, you know, having a project like this obviously has benefits uh, from an economic development perspective, but also um, does have mobility uh, um, benefits such as walking and bicycling. So now P uh, cars might slow down as they're approaching the promenade since there might be more activity. Um, there's more people walking, there's more access. So certainly a, a big goal of this project. Also improve safety and commercial success. So this is something that was identified by the city, again, to improve the economic vitality of the downtown. And lastly, uh, acquire input uh, uh, from the community um, and outline what a permanent implementation of this project can look like. So you know, if, if the city likes it, if the stakeholders love it, um, the city can then go ahead and, and see what they can do to make this a permanent project and, and implement more permanent infrastructure that will ensure um, you know, people can enjoy it for a longer time. Project timeline. So as I mentioned on the left, uh, the project started in, in November of 2021. Um, a, a key component of this project uh, are these, what we call these community touch points. Essentially they're workshops um, with members in the community. So it involves uh, our team going to the community and, and getting input from stakeholders on the corridor and also from members of the community at large 
So we're doing seven of these touch points. So uh, that'll be happening throughout the project. Um, here on the sort of lighter shade of pink, you see our, our kickoff and quick build demonstration. So we actually went ahead and uh, the street was closed back in November of 2022. Um, and several elements have been installed in the, in the, in the last uh, three months. So I'll, again, I'll show photos of that. So that demonstration is currently ongoing. It is designed and scheduled to conclude um, in the early summer of this year. Um, and so that's that's the goal. So we're, we're, we're constantly sort of assessing the progress of it, but that's that's where, um, we're, we're, where we'll close the demonstration and then the entire project would conclude um, later in the year. So this is what Rockwood Avenue um, looks like now or looked like before implementation. Um, on the left side, you see this is uh, the street um, looking north. A couple of things you'll note is the poor conditions of the pavement. That was uh, always a, a big complaint um, for, for residents and, and, and uh, business owners. Um, you will also see quite a bit of parking. There were 28 parking spaces located on this block. Um, and then uh, a lot of sidewalk activity, mainly sort of on the, uh, under these kind of awnings um, on the front on the frontage of, of the businesses but you'll see that on, on certainly on the right side that's a little more visible uh, but that's that's what the street looks like uh, looked like before the implementation um, here's a concept design of of what we're looking what we look to do so uh, again Um, this is what the concept design looked like. So what we did is we, you know, we, we worked with the city, we, we got some initial input from community stakeholders. And again, the city submitted a grant for this. So they, they had an understanding of what they, will, they wanted to see. They knew they wanted the street closed. Um, however, uh, what was up in the air was sort of what goes in that space. You know, we, we, we've seen other projects where you close the street, create a promenade space, but you need to fill it in so that it activates uh, the space and, and doesn't, isn't just sort of an empty, empty space. So, um, you know, that was, that was sort of the, the, big, the big aspect of it. Um, but you know, we also had to submit plans to ensure that anything that was done here uh, was done according to um, any traffic standards and code and had to be approved. Um, and that's a big thing with these quick build projects is that um, even though it's, it's, it's not a full permanent project, it still needs to take into account all traffic standards and guidelines. It still needs to be developed by a, a, a registered engineer to ensure that um, everything is designed according to the to to MUTCD standards and and, um, and code. Uh, that'll ensure that the project uh, in, it reduces liability on the city side um, and still ensures that that aspects are installed to allow for um, appropriate traffic movement and, and, um, and pedestrian movement. So this is what we submitted. Um, in addition to that, we worked with the community to develop, okay, well, what, what are things that you would like to see? And things that we heard are, well, we'd like to see more seating. Uh, we'd like to see more shading, more vegetation. As you saw in some of those photos, there's not much of that in the area, uh, especially vegetation and, and, and greenery. So that was something that a lot of people wanted to see. Another, another thing that we heard from the community was more lighting. Um, it's very active during, during the day, especially as, as people are walking through and going uh, through the port of entry and crossing through here. But at night, it, it pretty much uh, shuts down and, and people are concerned about actual like crime and safety. And so they would like to see more light. So those are sort of the main things that we heard. And so the, those were some of the things that we wanted to see. Um, or, or wanted to see how we can implement. So this is how the project looks now. This picture was taken back in December. Um, a big aspect of this project, the city also received um, grant funds through the Bloomberg Foundation uh, to do asphalt art uh, on the northern half of the promenade or, or the street. So this is what this is here. The city went through a very um, a, a, a comprehensive sort of uh, RFP process with local artists where they um, you know, receive proposals on the designs and, and sort of um, you know, what, what they would look like. So I think here, the big thing that, that they wanted to show with these sort of spirals is almost mimic like a, like a turnstile as, as, and like a turnstile on the floor 
So on the, on the on the far end is is the Mexicali and the port of entry. So what they wanted to mimic is as people are walking north and south through the promenade, um, these spirals almost mimic like turnstiles. Um, the, what the city also wanted to show is make sure that this was visible from the air. Uh, the the local regional airport is is a little west from here, so they wanted to see. Um, you know, they wanted to make sure it was visible if people were flying in. So different different aspects, and th this one this was meant to sort of give the project also um, kind of a, a brand, uh, uh, an identification um, marker. So so this is what what went in um, in December. The city held a huge community painting event, um, and you know it was led by the local artists. But you know community members were welcome to help um, you know paint paint these. Uh, the, the asphalt part. Um, here's, in addition to that, uh, we also developed some concepts for how we want to do the placemaking. So uh, what, again, we heard more seating, more greenery. So we laid out a plan of how we can do that while incorporating the asphalt art. So you'll see on the bottom half, um, you know, we, we wanted to develop like kind of like a grove setting where trees and seating can be, can be applied. So on the next slide, you'll see um, some of the trees that we ordered more seating went in. And again, this, this gave uh, people a, an opportunity to sit down. There's a local Jack in the Box in 7-Eleven. So people usually like grab a cup of coffee, come and sit there, um, enjoy the trees and just kind of hang out. So that's that's what we wanted to create. Um, so these images are, are of when the, the trees were installed and the, the, the furniture was being bolted down. Um, one key thing is making sure that the colors um, the colors matched sort of how the mural looked or the asphalt art looked. So kind of keep a consistent color scheme going um, in a way that's festive and 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 um, and and sort of very um, like illuminating for this for this for the space. So certainly something that we wanted to show with this. I'll touch on uh, the latter part on some of the community engagement that we did as part of this project. So. Um, we did a, a walk and bike audit back in May. Um, so we worked with community members. This was led by our partner, the LA County Bicycle Coalition. Um, and so we, we conducted a walk and bike audit uh, in the area. And again, just conducting an audit of, of assessing sort of conditions in the area and how, how improvements uh, can be, well, what improvements are needed and how this project is going to address some of those. So we certainly did that. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, we're doing these community touch points. So we, we did one here where we created these customized tags. This was still, we wanted to be sensitive to, um, to the COVID-19 pandemic. So it was more of a passive style engagement. People got these door hangers, uh, clicked the QR code. There was a community survey through that. Um, and so that was, that was a way that we received input on, on what they would like to see and elements that that they would like to see on, on the promenade as well. We also had another community touch point at the Mexican Independence Day event. Uh, this was back in September. So again, uh, you'll see us, uh, our team here, um, getting input from residents. Again, the goal was to reach out to the stakeholders and, and, get the, and have them uh, understand that the project is coming, but also hear of what they would like to see on the corridor and, and, and the promenade area. A big aspect of this was also the business uh, stakeholders. So we did a couple of business canvassing events um, over the last several months. Uh, this involved us going door to door. There are 13 businesses on uh, fronting Rockwood. So again, telling them this product is coming, the city applied for these funds, and what are your concerns? What are things that you would like to see? So this was, this was a critical step because we wanted to make sure that uh, businesses were supportive and and, um, you know, and, and wanted to see the project go in, but we also wanted to address their concerns. Um, now, full disclosure here, um, as of, as of uh, maybe a month ago, we, when we talked to some of the businesses, it's, it's split, you know, some businesses aren't 100% for the project, mainly because of the loss of parking, um, and also, uh, you know, concerns about loading, but we've been working with them through the city, and trying to address those concerns. Uh, other businesses love the project. They love that there's foot traffic uh, on Rockwood and you know, they, they see that you know, creating events and bringing people there will lead to more business for their, for their establishment. So 
Um, you know, we, we expected that uh, not every business is going to be for it, especially if they see the loss of parking. Uh, that is something that that is of concern, but we're, we're trying to find ways to mitigate that um, and doing continuing the business outreach uh, to ensure that that their concerns are addressed. Um, we also had a Chris, uh, the city had a Christmas tree lighting ceremony back in December. Um, so this this was soon after the street was closed. So again, uh, getting input from residents. This was a big community event. There was a lot of activities for kids, um, and and you know they had uh, the the local high school um, band perform, and there was a lot of involvement. People were dancing. They had a band, uh, a DJ, and everything. And so this really to us con uh, conveyed what the potential of this space can be. Um, you know, if, if events are planned correctly and, and we can bring people out here, then, you know, businesses will succeed and, and, and may, most importantly, um, the residents of Calexico will have a place to go. And that's really what we heard during that day is, is you know, from, from parents and residents is like, you know, this is exactly what we need because, you know, we want to have, uh, we want to have a place for our teenagers to go to, we want to, a safe space where they can hang out, they can go shopping, they can, you know, have an ice cream, they can hang out. This is what they, this is something that collect, they convey to us that Calexico needs. And this, you know, this is what the space can provide um, if, if it's up to its full potential. So, you know, right now we're, we can, we're continuing to coordinate with the city on planning additional events to ensure that the space continues to be activated. So next steps, we'll continue having conversations um, with, with the community and, and business stakeholders. Um, we will also continue uh, uh, checking on specific metrics. So we, we did like before and after counts to check on vehicle speeds, how people are, are walking through the, the promenade. So we have all that before the project was implemented. We'll be taking counts you know, now that the product is implemented and sort of doing the comparison. Um, and we'll continue as, uh, to assess business needs and determine, you know, if the project remains uh, permanent or not. So it's it's ongoing. Um, and again, that's really the goal of this this product is to tweak where we need, adjust, uh, keep our, our ear on the ground and hear what the community needs and, and the stakeholders there and continue uh, moving forward. So I think that concludes my presentation. Back to you, Andres. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos, uh, for that presentation. I um, wanted to hear from you, uh, especially since the community touch points spanned before the implementation, during the implementation, even some somewhat after, uh, and you had utilized a variety of tactics. Uh, was there any tactic that that stood out to you as being particularly effective in either you know, disseminating information or gathering good feedback. Yeah, thanks, Andres. Um, I'd say going, doing the business canvassing was probably the most effective. Um, ultimately, we can't, uh, you know, not everyone's going to agree on a project. Everyone's going to have a million opinions of what they like and don't like. But going to their storefronts, asking them, of what about the uh, you know what they would like to see and then after it was implemented um you know hearing from them on well i don't like it because i lost parking or what are you going to do to address that you know showing that we're there and we're address uh, you know we're listening to them and sometimes a lot of a lot of them is a, a lot of times what they need is is they need to be they, they need to feel they're being heard and so going to them and, and listening to them and, and taking those concerns back and working with the city to see how we can address those is, is really critical. So um, I, I'd say that was probably the most effective. Um, Calexico uh, functions, uh, you know, they're like, I, I'd say, I mean, and this might sound like a generalization, but you know, the younger, the younger generation, they're more in tune, obviously, digitally and and you know, with digital means of, of engagement. But a lot of the business owners, a lot of the, the stakeholders, the parents who are sort of traversing through Rockwood, you know, they prefer face-to-face -face interaction. So going to you know, the Mexican Independence Day Festival, being at the, uh, at the Christmas tree lighting ceremony, 
talking to them directly and talking to the businesses, going to the storefronts um, is, is, I'd say, the, the most effective way of, of being a project partner with them. That's so great. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I have a couple more questions for you, but I, you know, I'll save those as, and ask them broadly to the to the group. At this point, I, I can move to uh, the third presentation on Muskoi so sidewalks for safety. Maha. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Andres, for having me today. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Well, um, my name is Maha Rizvi. I'm the district director for Assembly Majority Leader Eloise Luis Gomez Reyes. Um, I'm going to tell you about the story about my, my project that I've done for this office. That's I call my baby. <laughs> it's something that I'm very passionate about, something I didn't realize I would be passionate about, uh, infrastructure projects. So, um, in so with any type of project, you need partner organizations. Um, this Muscogee Coalition started with just one single coalition of students and parents called the Thorai uh, Community Coalition. This coalition started in 2017 when I from the Office of Assembly Member Reyes, I was in charge of youth projects. And one thing we wanted to do was call, host a forum for our young adults and youth, high school, elementary school, to see what they wanted to hear from our, from our office. You know, we wanted them to call, dream big. So we called it Dream Big, i.e. for the Inland Empire. And so we had them break up into different groups and we, on different issues such as environmental justice, business, health, infrastructure. And one of the small coalitions, they told us about the issues in Muskoi um, that they did not have sidewalks. And for me, I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. That's something I knew. I, this is 2017. This is the first time I started this job. Didn't really know much about San Virginia community. I was new. I lived in Riverside County. And so I was like, okay, this is something that's interesting, just sidewalks. And they explained to us that they walk, they, since they were little, they, oh, many of the schools in uh, Muscoy Elementary, rural community, that they walk to school. Um, may, many of the parents don't have jobs that they don't they can't take their kids to school so many of them walk and many of the older kids walk their school students to schools and that they believe it's not safe that there's a lot there are traffic issues there that there's a lot it's just something that they identified as some that they wanted to fix and as the assembly majority leader she was intrigued about this idea like okay sidewalks that's something that's you can't, we would think that every, at least around the schools that they have. And so we decided that that's something that we're gonna focus on for the office. And so we started the SOAR IE Community Coalition where we brought in students, parents, local nonprofits in the Muscoy community, uh, which mental health services, IE Bike Alliance, organizations who are, in, who care about infrastructure. And lucky enough, I met, Safe Routes to National Partnership uh, and two of their, one of their organizers who guided me throughout this process. Also with this, co uh, this partner organization, we work with the County of San Bernardino, the Public Works Department, the Public Health Department. And we of course worked with the San Bernardino uh, County Transportation Agency, Omnitrans and the Southern California Association of Government, SCAG. So thank you for having us here. Um, so Muscoy at a glance, so Sa County of San Bernardino is one of the largest counties in the U United States. It's an incorporated community above um, San the city of San Bernardino. It is 88% Latino Hispanic household. The median income is 45,000 uh, and uh, about 24, 25% live in property. So uh, with the Cal and Ryer screen, population burden of this area is 96 to 100% burden. 
So this is an area that has a lot of needs. And, you know, with such a large county, not and limited resources, there's so much the county can do. And so, and this is kind of the timeline of this project. So in 2017, in December, we hosted this project. And so in 20, 2000, March 2018, we started this SOAR IE coalition. We did like an initial walk audit of Muskoi to kind of see what the community is seeing. But we want to hear from them and we want, we want to learn more about the community. And so that's kind of how this coalition started. And throughout the process, we learned, we again connected with Safe Route to School, Demi Espinoza. She was kind of my partner in this. I didn't know anything about infrastructure projects. I didn't really know how we can get funding for this and what we can do. So she was able to connect me to the county and was able to kind of guide me on what's been done. And we actually learned that there was a report done by KOA regarding, um, the safe the sidewalks safety coalition here and I, they've done some work with sidewalks but not enough where the community felt safe and so with Demi kind of helping me and guiding me we've learned about SCAD Go Human and we learned about that they had a grant open to do community temporary demonstration and so we were like, okay, we want the county to be involved. We want this to be a project that's a priority. So we applied for the grant and we were able to get the grant uh, to do three temporary demonstration. And from March to June, that's what we worked on. And while in that timeline, we were talking to the county, talking about how this was a priority for the community, how this was a priority for our office. And I know what we learned about was the ATP, the active transportation planning cycle uh, grant, cycle four uh, was due in July. We, I know many people are working on these grants for a while. We didn't know about this because this was a project we just kind of came to us. And so we were, but I know we were not able to be the ones to apply for Karen because they had to be a, a good government agency who oversees it. So we had to work with the county. We had to make sure that they were on board. And so with several communications and several meetings with them and talking to them about like, hey, this is a priority for a community, we got them on board. And so we hosted a community demonstration with SCAD, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. And by July 20, 2018, we had quickly turned around and put in a grant uh, for the cycle, for cycle four. And so this was kind of the uh, temporary demonstration. We did three different uh, categories. We did temporary uh, crosswalks. We created bulb out shelter, bulb outs around the um, curbs and we created temporary bus shelters. And so we had 40 volunteers from the community and plus 10 staff working to create these projects. Uh, we decided not only to create these projects, but to do like a community barbecue so we can get feedback from uh, people who live in Muskoi. And so we had nearly 100 people attend to learn about what we're doing, uh, about why this is important. And we want to hear from them what they saw were the priorities, not only like we know what we see, but we want to hear directly from them. And so uh, from those uh from that community demonstration, we were able to get uh, about 100 people, uh, around 100 people to uh, comment for, with their kids. They came out, they tried out the different demonstrations and they provided that the two main things that they were looking for were of course more sidewalks, but also better crosswalks. As I don't know if you can tell in the picture, it's kind of small, but it, it wasn't clear and with not a lot of safety features, just cars and only stop signs, cars just keep, keep on just racing through these crosswalks and they're not that visible. And so those were kind of the two main things that we saw from that feedback we received from the community. And so with the information that we got from that temporary feed, the temporary project, we put everything we got, we work with the county and I, I've never wrote in a grant, but I was able to write, type up a part of the ATP grant, which was exciting. 
no experience in it, but I mean, it gave me kind of looking at that application was very intimidating. But of course, the San Bernardino County was doing most of the grant writing. I just had put information on about the community and uh, demonstrations that we did. And so we quickly turned in an application and replied by July. Uh, by December, uh, we, it, we released the scores and unfortunately we got a 70, our score was 70, which wasn't too high. Uh, I, but, and of course we were disappointed, especially with all the community input that we received, but we knew that we weren't gonna give up. And so we're gonna apply for cycle five. And, but this time we learned with the feedback that we've received from cycle four that we can take back and apply, first of all, start the application process early, but also apply it for uh, cycle five. And so we still want to keep our community engaged. And so we kept on making sure that they felt like their voices were being heard. So we worked with Cal Walks to create a community and pedestrian bike, bicycle safe, safety training action plan and workshop. And so we were actually able to get a report, which we used that for a cycle five. And we also um, worked with the schools, Muscoy Elementary and Wormaw Elementary, the two mil elementary schools in the community uh, to do a walk to school day and to get more parents involved. And so we planned that we brought in more more community feedback forms so we can make sure that we can use that for cycle five and in between that we we got commitments from san Bernardino, no from safe route to par safety partnership that they're gonna apply uh you give provide us technical assistance on this application so now we had those expertise who can also give feedback while we're doing this application and we so we started in september uh the new application cycle and so uh, January 22 was our first 20 uh, planning meeting for it. We discussed how we're gonna break it down, what we needed, what we wanted to see in the applications and how we can prove from, we went over our score from 2019 and what we need improvement and where we needed technical expertise. And so throughout the year, we work with the Muscoy Elementary School, their parent groups, because they were really excited that this is something that they want to see and that we're not giving up. And so we did a couple of walkthroughs. We had them involved in our planning meetings. And so this coalition, even though San Bernardino County, who was up writing the grant, we had they engaged us into the process where we were able to provide feedback. I know I would I was not as involved in this application, but I was able to provide letters of support, get other people engaged to make sure that this was a robust application. And so we did apply again this year in July, and then 2021, we found out we got it. We got a score of 91. We were the only, we were the second grant from the County of San Bernardino that was selected. So we were really excited. I know a lot of people remember where they were when, when like JFK died or Randy, but I remember where I was when we got this application because this was my project for the last two years. I was in my first grad school class and I was just really excited. I had to turn off my screen and call my boss because we, this was something we, we don't make promises in government, but this was a promise we met. So this was a promise made and promise kept. And so we were really excited about this grant. And so, and so these were different things that we did for our community engagement, as I talked about our temporary demonstration, our community, the action, the action planning meeting and our clear, clean air day. And so this shows that we did have a lot of community engagement. Um, we did get some opposition as well. Uh, Muskoi is a rural community. And so, and there's a lot of people who Ride, ride horses there. And so those were people who were not too excited about our sidebox plan. And so that's why we kept, we made sure it was not taking over, but making sure it was a safe route to school. So it was a direct pathway. And so with 
that these these are some other pictures of the community engagement that we had. And so the safety features we applied to in this project. So we uh, we got a grant total of one point eight million. The sidewalk construction of se about seven thousand feet of sidewalks around Muskoy and Vermont Elementary School. So not all in Muskoy, but around the school. Uh, crossing beacon. So we were able to get 22 rapid rectangles uh, flashing beacons so we make sure that our cars are able to see these crosswalks and then we upgraded 29 crosswalks to ladder style crosswalk more visible and then we did uh, apply for um, improving some of the uh, ADA ramps so we made sure that this was a, a robust uh, safety features for our community. And so with that, the project uh, phase one has been completed where they've done the striped crosswalks around uh, both Vermont and Muskoy Elementary. And so now we're in phase two, uh, which this is the sidewalks part. And so they're right now, the county is finalizing the project, project design and requiring them right away. Uh, right now it is 65% completed and they believe the construction will be starting in summer 2024. And with that, that is kind of the, the Muskoy application. It's something that I'm very proud of. And without the community voice, we were not we would not be pushing for it. And so we were happy that our community was involved. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Maha, for such a great presentation and for that uh that update on the on the project. It's that temporary demonstration, as you had noted, was a Skagco human demonstration. So it's really great to see um, the impact of, of an event, even though it, it happened some year some years ago. Uh, I have a, a question for you, um, which we had talked about the the other day. You know, you talked about, you know, that you learned the ATP process, that you hadn't had the experience of this before, and you, you dove in and developing the application. Um, and that this was a process where where you had applied twice. It's a, and then my thinking is like, what what was the motivation for you know for approaching this challenge? What was your motivation uh, for this? Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, it was a community. Just not only seeing the young kids who were in elementary school, but also middle school and high school talk about their passion of why they need it. I think that's what motivated us to first join this project. And that they're, that uh, this is a community that doesn't have a lot of resources, a community that has been ignored. Uh, you know, they, they said that they've tried to bring more awareness to this, but it, it kind of fell on deaf ears. So we, for us, this was it was a community driven project, and that's what made it special to us because we heard, we heard directly from them, and they kept us accountable. They they kept calling us, they kept on reaching out to us, and that's what we as a government that's how what we like, and that's how it should be. Great, thank you so much. Um, so at this point, uh, I want to open it up to um, questions for the full panel. Um, I, I have some questions here I, I'm very curious about in, you know, in furthering this discussion, but if anybody uh, in the audience has questions, feel free to uh, write it in the chat or to raise their hands. And um, um, this, we have a question in the chat from Alina Borja. Great. She says, Maha, how did you get connected to those partners you showed on the first slides? So that's a great question. So it actually happened to be a luck. I got connected to uh, Demi Espinoza from Safe After School. I went to uh, I event for CARB and uh, I was just introduced to her. I was like, and she introduced me that she's Safe for After School Partnership. And I was like, oh, hey, this is something that came up to our community, would you be interested in um, working with us? And she gave me her card. And so we connected and 
without her partnership, I don't know how far I would have gotten because it's, it's definitely confusing, you know, of working for the state. I'm like, oh, why can't we just get state funding for it? Didn't realize how much it goes into it. And so she was able to connect me. She connected me to SCAG. She connected me um, to just different community organizations. Uh, for the coalition uh, that that started off with um, with the Safe Route to School, so that started with our Dream Big IE, and so we, I was able to connect Demi with that organization, and so that's how this project kind of started about. I working for the state, you know, I work with the county on different different partnerships. On you know, they reach out to us for letters of support. So, and, you know, with their government contacts, so we, we reached out to them like, hey, this is something that we heard and this is something we're interested in. And so that's how the initial county partnership started. And so, you know, keeping in touch with them and keeping those relationships. I think one thing in our office that we feel strongly about is our relationship building. So that I started in 2017 and the first year, we did a lot of events, but we did a lot of relationship building, making sure that we knew who our community partners were, what resources they are. And I think that was a helpful for us um, be because I met organizations in the environmental justice field. I was a, they connected me at this organization, at, at this meeting to Demi. And because of that part relationship, I was able to connect with Demi and continue that partnership. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Are there uh, any other questions from the um, the audience? Well, as folks are thinking of their questions and typing them out, um, I have a question of my own. And uh, this is for, I invite the, the full panel to respond. Uh, so the theme of this session today is planning with rural communities. Uh, I'm interested in some of the ways uh, where you've worked with communities uh, to inform the direction of your of your project, and I think I could I could start first with Carlos. Uh, I guess so, what are some of those elements of the quick build had changed that that had changed? You mentioned there was a few instances where you're getting feedback, so I'd love you to to elaborate more on that. On like the elements specifically. Yeah, or any of the elements or, or some of the, the broader kind of goals or objectives. Yeah, I mean, it, it all, it where the community had more of a say is on the type of treatments because um, uh, the type of treatments that fill in the space. Um, and that's really where we wanted to hear from them. Um, you know, they, we, because ultimately the project needs to address, at least in our eyes, needs to address an issue. Um, and in order to for it to be effective, it's we, we have to find a way of doing that in a ideally community driven way. So um, so that was sort of the first aspect that we wanted to hear about is, OK, well, what are the issues here? What's going on and what would you like to see? Uh, so when we did our first business canvassing back in September, uh, those were some of the questions that we asked them. And that's how we got information on. Okay, yeah, we'd like to see more street furniture because ideally there's, there's, you know, there'd be space for people to sit and hang out. Uh, we need more greenery. Uh, and if we get big enough trees, then they can provide some shade um, and lighting as well because of, uh, you know, issues of crime or, or darkness late at night. Um, so those are the, the easy ones that we could easily address with, with the elements that we chose. Um, the tricky part now is continuing these conversations and ensuring that we're addressing their ongoing needs. Um, I will say that the tough part of this is that we are bound by sort of the project element types. So because it is a quick build project, you know, we cannot go in and say, dig up the asphalt and add in like, you know, pillars or, or other aspects that will allow for more permanent style improvements. 
Um, we can't really break concrete and do that. So, so we, we have to also manage their expectations a bit and say, well, you know, we can find creative ways of providing you with more shade, more of this, but it has to be in this manner. Um, so that, that is that is sort of what we're hearing right now is is people want to want to see more shade just because it is a desert environment. You know, I think um, it'll start getting hot pretty soon if it's not already. So, um, you know, we want it to be used. Um, same thing with the types of trees that we chose. We made sure they were drop tolerant and, and card little maintenance, but we, we have to be cognizant of the type of environment we're in. And so continuing to have those conversations um, and selecting specific elements that are tailored to that and still meet the scope of the project um, is important. Great. Thank you so much, Carlos. I appreciate that insight. And, and David, um, you know, asking you and, and, you know, how local communities are informing the direction of, of your project, I know you mentioned that um, you're just kind of finishing up the data consolidation phase, so perhaps it's a little bit early. So my question to you is, um, in this ground truth thing that you are uh, looking to do with the data that you collect, what are some of those, the, the questions that you, that you hope to have answered through perhaps a, 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 a community engagement process. Oh, and you are still on mute, so. Well, in, in terms of the uh, issues and, and uh, infrastructure services that we're talking about, uh, there's no better, higher authority than the local population because they're the ultimate uh, beneficiaries uh, of these things and there are essentially uh there are still constraints i mean there are terrible constraints right now but even when these funds become available there will be constraints on uh, how how far they can be allocated uh, how many different categories of need can be met so we want to make, it, we think it's very essential that the local community uh, play a direct role in setting those priorities and i i was one thing i was going to say in general response to your question uh when it comes to trying to essentially reach out for local sentiment, uh, we find in our experience, both in the United States and about half of our practice, which is in developing countries, that uh, understanding and finding a way to penetrate local hierarchies is a very significant challenge. And uh, we really have to be meticulous in doing that. Uh, and we also need to work with local counterparts who have credibility that uh, we're never going to be able to possess. I mean, if you look at like, if you're someone who looks like me and you want to work with a rural community in Cambodia, uh, you can't really do that directly. You've got to rely on people that have uh, local uh, identification skills, uh, language and other skills, and uh, and can really establish a rapport. So we're going to be doing, taking a multi-layered approach to communicating uh, to make sure that we can, uh, convince people that uh, this this opportunity is real and that they have a stake in trying to influence it. Uh, that's just the first step though, because we're working for a, a, essentially a, not even a statewide agency, but a, a local regional agency. The state will have to play a role in this and ultimately the federal government will have to play a role. And so, as I said, one of our most important uh, responsibilities is to establish those standards for local engagement and make sure that they're inherited uh, throughout the process as the process is essentially taken over by higher authorities in Sacramento and Washington. Uh, it's a, it, it'll be a big challenge. But I think to really succeed, uh, we'll have to, we'll have to um, essentially establish a standard for local engagement and make sure that it's, uh, it, it's sustained. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate that. I see we do have a hand from uh, Miranda. Um, it can come off mute and uh, feel free to ask your question. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone's uh, insight from today's session. Uh, my question specifically is for Carlos though. Um, Carlos, I was just curious uh, regarding specifically the like promenade and walkability and bicycle um, and pedestrian opportunities that you're creating. Um, moving forward, next steps, do you and how are you building partnerships and um, 
sourcing funding opportunities to further promote walkability and, and bicycle ability, or even just, you know, um, creating less of a reliance on cars in that area? Are there funding sources or partnerships that you guys have that are incentivizing potentially like purchasing bicycles for community members or holding workshops even for um, bike maintenance is a big problem where I'm from um, in the AMBAG region. So like creating workshops where people can fix their bikes or learn about their bikes or even having incentives and rebates or whatever for purchasing that types of things. Do you guys have any next next steps that you could touch on for that? Thanks, Miranda. Um, short answer is no. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason is, is um, you know, the project is, is focused on sort of that promenade space. And it's, it's more of a tool. I mean, although there are benefits to mobility and, and active transportation, it's not the main element of it. Um, you know, the main, the main aspect is, is creating a space for, for community members to, to be in, in, in the downtown. Um, but, you know, the benefits to mobility are there. Now you have a pedestrian space, which, which has a lot of, a lot of benefits. Uh, we haven't looked or we haven't worked directly with the city on sort of getting to the space, you know, because that is the missing element of like how, okay, now that you have the space, how do we keep people from driving to it from other parts of Calexico or Imperial County and, and getting to the space? Maybe there's ways we can, um, you know, incentivize other modes of transportation. That is, that is something we haven't looked at just yet um, because the focus has been on sort of working with the businesses and ensuring sort of this is a space that works for them as well as for the stakeholders or the residents. Um, but that's a good question. Um, and I think that might be something we can bring up to the city um, to explore like different mobility, uh, uh, mobility like campaigns or, or mobility projects that the city is looking into and seeing how those can be integrated into the promenade. Now, the big thing is this space is also, you know, six, uh, meant to be there for six months. So the permanency of it is, 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 is a bit of an issue because if we start looking at creating infrastructure going to it, um, and then, you know, come August, it's gonna go back to what it was, sort of creates certain issues there. Um, but I think as, as we hear more from the community, as we have ongoing conversations with the city, we can certainly explore ways to, to facilitate more active mobility to and from the space. But um, yeah, to answer your question, no, we have not. Um, but we can look more into that. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. And thanks, Miranda, for your question. Uh, does anybody else uh, on the line have a question? Feel free to raise your hand or input it in the chat. I have I have some uh, uh, closing kind of remarks uh, for for this session to wrap it up, but I think just that my one last question to you all, um, uh, I think just very quickly, um, one thing that was a, a a common theme throughout each one of your presentations were these partnerships between community members and and local agencies or agencies across the state, either at the you know, city level or at, you know, the different utility providers are, that have data available. Um, there are many agency folks uh, on, on the line, uh, many of whom are interested in these partnerships. Very quickly, it's like, are there any ways, any good tactics or, or frameworks to keep in mind to help those partnerships be, I guess, a little bit easier or more accessible? Uh, when thinking about partnerships between agencies and community members. And that's for, for e either, either of the panelists on the line. So Andres, you're asking about partnerships? 
yeah, it's like kind of what, what can help make a partnership more accessible? Yeah, one thing we're, we're looking at with our project is, is building more partnerships with, um, with other organizations in, in the greater Imperial Valley. So um, one thing with the city of Calexico is, you know, and, and probably like many rural agencies is, is they're small, they're sort of short staffed, um, sort of there's, there's a resource um, issue there. And so they can't, they can't do a lot. And with a, with a project like this, it's required a lot of like, okay, well, we have the space now, let's, let's focus on the programming, right? What, what can we do to create activities? So like you saw in the images of the Christmas tree lighting ceremony, like how do we create more of those types of events? But, you know, with, with these small, with these small agencies, you know, they have a very limited budget to, to put together events like that. And, and, you know, the biggest cost is typically, you know, staff time and ensuring that people, you know, staff is there to staff the events. So one thing that we've been working with them is finding partnerships of or, like organizations in the area to kind of tell them, hey, look, there's a space now here. Um, you can use it to hold your events. So, um, so that's, that's sort of the next step we, we're working. We're, we're trying to reach out to, for example, the, the local um, chamber of commerce and say, hey, look, there's, you guys can hold um, you know, business events here or booths for any other events that you have. Um, working, I, I, they're having an event next, uh, later this week with the local organization that they're handling all of that and the city's just processing any permitting. Um, but that's, that's, I think, where we want to get to with this space is it becomes an area where any local organization, any community group can use. Um, another, another potential activity is working with the local, um, Arts Council, the Collectical Arts Council, they're very supportive of this project and they're very involved in the community. So doing like, like folklorico, you know, dance classes and arts events on this, in, in the space in the evening when it cools down, that is something that they're looking into as well. So um, building partnerships for, for a community like Collectical is just critical because again, the city can't do everything to program, uh, but you know, finding ways to do it with other organizations that have similar goals um, is, 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 is very critical for a project like this. Great, thank you. And um, I think in this last moment, uh, Jennifer, if you could please uh, uh, post or share the, um, my slides here. Um, so SCAG has a variety of additional resources for planning with rural communities. Uh, we have recently uh, published a, a workshop on uh, transportation demand management strategies for suburban and rural communities available on SCAG's website. Uh, we also have a video as well. And uh, we had a variety of uh, previous Toolbox Tuesday sessions focused on rural communities, as well as uh, some uh, research and action plans that were developed that uh, pertain to a lot of issues um, that are a par a particular note within many of the rural areas of SCAG. Uh, so this all will be included in the slides that we share out uh, by email. And then as you go, the last thing that we ask is if you could take a quick two minute survey to help us improve to future Toolbox Tuesday sessions. We're really interested uh, to hear from you all how we did and, and what else you are interested in learning. Um, so at this time, I, I want to thank our, our three panelists, uh, David, Carlos, and, and Maha. Thank you so much for uh, offering your stories. And thank you so much to the SCAG staff uh, working to help put this on. Uh, appreciate the time and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon, everybody. All the best, everyone.